For a so-called low fantasy series, A Song of Ice and Fire's got some pretty weird shit, to be honest. I mean, consider Patchface. What? I don't. Need, I still don't know what to make of that guy. One of the kings of Westeros just lets that guy babysit his daughter. That's pretty weird. And uh, so is the Black Gate, the Night Fort, the talking weirwood face that you walk through the mouth of it to go through the tunnel to north of the wall. That, that's pretty weird. But the weirdest place in Westeros, guys, it's got to be Moat Kaelin, an abandoned gargantuan castle built in an overly inhospitable swamp constructed entirely of megalithic blocks of black basalt, which were once piled as high as 80 feet in the air but which now lie scattered all about the bog. Moat Kalen is really something we'd expect to find in Sothorios, or perhaps a shy, and yet it's right in the middle of Westeros. No other castle on this continent looks anything like it, and frankly, the official story that it's just another castle of the first men doesn't make a lot of sense. Moat Kalen is associated with the Hammer of the Waters. It might be built of oily black stone, and some believe it might have been the original castle of the first Night's Watch. Or it might have been built by the Squishers. Or maybe the Great Empire of the Dawn. No one seems to think the Cranog men built it, even though they're the ones who live in the swamp. And we'll take a look at all of these ideas and theories and tell you what we do and don't know about one of my absolute favorite places. That's right, it's one of the weirdest, also my favorite place in Westeros, Moat Kalen. Hey guys, David Lightbringer here. Thanks for joining me. And once again, it's time to play Disaster Hunters of Ancient Westeros, Moat Kaelin Edition. If you're new to the channel, do hit the uh, subscribe button below. would appreciate that. If you liked the video, click the like button, leave a comment, tell me what you think. And with that said, let's take a look at the two detailed descriptions of Moat Kaelin. This first one that we'll quote comes from a Catelyn chapter of A Game of Thrones, as Rob's army is marching south. And then we'll compare some of these lines to Theon's description of Moat Kaelin from A Dance with Dragons as we go along. Just beyond, through the mists, she glimpsed the walls and towers of Moat Kaelin, or what remained of them. Immense blocks of black basalt, each as large as a crofter's cottage, lay scattered and tumbled like a child's wooden blocks, half sunk in the soft, boggy soil. Nothing else remained of a curtain wall that had once stood as high as Winterfell's. The wooden keep was gone entirely, rotted away a thousand years past, with not so much as a timber to mark where it had stood. All that was left of the great stronghold of the first men were three towers, three where there had once been twenty, if the tale-tellers could be believed. The gatehouse tower looked sound enough and even boasted a few feet of standing wall to either side of it. The drunkard's tower, off in the bog where the south and west walls had once met, leaned like a man about to spew a bellyful of wine into the gutter. And the tall, slender children's tower, where legends said the children of the forest had once called upon their nameless gods to send the hammer of the waters, had lost half its crown. It looked as if some great beast had taken a bite out of the crenellations along the tower top and spit the rubble across the bog. A crofter, if you didn't know, and I had to look this up, is a type of farmer, so a crofter's cottage basically just means cottage or small house. Now consider what's small for a house is very big for a piece of solid rock. That's right, that's, that's true, that's true. So Theon, when he visits Mount Caelan in A Dance with Dragons, he thinks to himself that these are blocks of black basalt so large it must once have taken a hundred men to hoist them into place. And that's a hundred men to hoist each block, just to give you an idea. So a cottage-sized block of black basalt is a megalith. It's incredibly heavy, and this entire fortress seems to have been built from these megaliths, chiefly this curtain wall and all the towers, however many there were. But also even the interior of the castle, such as this table that we'll talk about later, is built from the same black stone. Now, we don't know for certain whether the curtain wall really did stand 80 feet tall, as Winterfell's does, but there's really little reason to doubt it, since the towers probably stand at least that high, and they are made from the same megaliths. Similarly, we can't be sure that there were once exactly 20 towers, but the main thing is that there does seem to be enough rubble strewn about the bog for people to believe that there was once 20 towers. 
So, three standing towers, and then 17 towers and a curtain wall's worth of megalithic rubble scattered about the bog. That, that's what we've got here. So, the first thing we've got to say is that it's daft to build a castle in a swamp, as all men know. One day, lad, all this will be yours. What, the curtains? No, not the damn curtains, lad. All that you can see stretched out over the hills and valleys of this land. This will be your kingdom, lad. But Dick... Nimble, lad. I'm nimble. Yes, yes, nimble. Sorry. I don't want any of that. Listen, lad. I built this kingdom up from nothing. When I started here, all there was was swamp. Other kings said I was daft to build a castle on a swamp. But I built it all the same, just to show them. It sank into the swamp. So, I built a second one. That sank into the swamp. So, I built a third one. That burned down, fell over... Then sank into the damn swamp, but the fourth one stayed up. And that's what you're gonna get, lad. The strongest castle in these islands. But I don't want any of that. I'd rather... Rather what? I'd rather... just... sing. Stop that, stop that, cut that out. You're not going into a damn song while I'm here. Hey guys, post-production, chillin' on the couch, LML here. And yes, that was not the original audio from the Monty Python clip. See, what had happened was... I made an original video with the original Monty Python clip, but that sank into the copyright swamp. So I made an edit, made a second video, that sank into the copyright swamp. So I made a third video, and yes, it burned down, fell over, and sank into the cop. But the fourth one, I acted out. And that's what you just got. Monty Python sketch with, well, I mean, I think I captured the essence. I may have changed the accents a little, but I think I got the essence of the scene. Anyway... Back to my previously recorded video, which assumes that you have just watched the actual Monty Python clip. Thanks for indulging me. It is daft to build a castle in a swamp. I mean, you heard the story the guy had to try four times, which is almost as many as during God's grief. Oh, that's right. This Monty Python sketch is, in fact, part of George's influence for during God's grief having to have built seven castles, seven, to get one. And honestly, the, the guy kind of sounds like Dern God's Grief, if you think about it. It's about, it's about the right tone. But I built it all the same. Now, Monty Python aside, it would certainly be extremely hard, if not impossible, to build a castle the size of Moat Kalin out of megaliths in the middle of a bog. Therefore, Moat Kalin was almost certainly built before things turned swampy around here. And by here, I mean the neck, which is a huge marshland slash bog slash swamp which sort of straddles the entire waste of Westeros. Sorry, I didn't mean to make the swamp sound so sexy. I mean, maybe it's a mirror swamp. Boom. So the swampification of the neck is associated with the hammer of the waters. I didn't bring my hammer today, for, you know, but hopefully you watched the hammer of the waters video. And even if you didn't, you just heard in the Catelyn quote that the hammer of the waters supposedly was called down by the children to flood the neck and then... Theon observes the children's tower at Moat Kaelin and recalls that this is where legend said the children of the forest had once called down the hammer of the waters to break the lands of Westeros in two. And then finally, the maesters in the world of ice and fire echo this, saying, legend says that the great floods that broke the land bridge that is now the broken arm and made the neck a swamp were the work of the green seers who gathered at Moat Kaelin to work dark magic. Now, there is definitely some confusion about whether there is supposed to have been just one hammer event that broke the arm of Dorne and flooded the neck, or whether or not those were two separate attempts at dropping a hammer. But either way, these events are all supposed to have taken place in the Dawn Age. Now, dating anything in Westeros from that long ago is pretty sketchy. I mean, cold hands may be from the Dawn Age, but you probably don't want to date him. I mean, with those hands. Ugh. That's a dating old things in Westeros joke. Anyway, the simple idea that the Hammer of the Waters was some kind of major environmental disaster involving flooding and sea level rise and earthquakes that seems to have taken place thousands of years ago does make it a pretty good candidate to have been the cause of the flooding of the neck. So these legends probably have some truth to them. And clearly we can say that massive flooding did happen here because again, you can't build a megalithic castle, especially in a swamp. You really do need solid ground to work with if you're going to try to stack megaliths up high to make towers and a giant wall. And, of course, you won't find much of that in a swamp. The neck is literally so boggy that in order to cross it, you have to build a wooden causeway or else you just kind of sink into the bog. 
We noticed that one of the three remaining towers at Moat Kalen is leaning, hence its name, the Drunkard's Tower, which means that the ground beneath its foundations has shifted since its construction, no doubt when this land was flooded. Now, the Maesters, ever skeptical, do raise the possibility that there was never one major flooding event, but rather a gradual rise in sea level, which inundated the Arm of Dorne over time. But we can easily dismiss this uh, for several reasons. First of all, this is a fantasy story, and we already know that the anti-magic skepticism of the Maesters is essentially written into the story as a plot device, and they're pretty much always wrong when they say magic doesn't exist. Secondly, I just made an awesome video, just mentioned it, Hammer of the Waters. What was the Hammer of the Waters? Check that out. And in that one, I believe that I was able to demonstrate with a pretty high degree of confidence that there almost certainly was uh, one big catastrophic flooding event tied to a sudden collapse of the Arm of Dorne, as opposed to a gradual rise in sea levels which simply submerged a low-lying land bridge. As we discussed, such a massive flooding event would have sent all kinds of tsunamis racing up the newly formed narrow sea. And of course, we identify the Dern Godscree flood as a record of some of this flooding. And therefore, this breaking of the Arm of Dorne event could have been responsible for the flooding of the Neck. Obviously, the Neck is much further away from the Arm of Dorne than Storm's End, and there's uh, the Eerie in the way, so it wouldn't have taken the brunt of the tsunami flooding. However, if the Neck already was a low-lying area of land, then it could have, or even would have been, you might say, somewhat or even completely inundated with salty seawater from the Hammer of the Waters event. And the key thing to remember here is that tsunami waves, they travel a very long way, basically until they're interrupted. And check out again this map of the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. You can see they, those waves make it quite a long way. So this then is probably why the Hammer of the Waters is sometimes also thought to have been called down uh, from Moat Kalin to break the neck, in addition to the main legend about it being called down from the Isle of Faces to break the Arm of Dorne. Now, the third reason to believe that the Hammer of the Waters was a compound earthquake and tsunami event that potentially affected half of Westeros, from the Arm of Dorne to the Neck, is found right here at Moat Kalen. Take a look around. Uh, this fortress isn't collapsed, my friends. It's kind of destroyed. These giant megalithic blocks are scattered and tumbled around the bog, says Catelyn, as if some great beast had taken a bite out of the crenellations along the tower top and spit the rubble across the bog. Theon, observing these same scattered megaliths, notes that some had sunk so deep into the bog that only a corner showed. Others lay strewn about like some god's abandoned toys, cracked and crumbling, spotted with lichen. So scattered and strewn like toys and... Those of you who have kids, I, I guess, think of your living room, right? <laughs> they, they, they just kind of end up everywhere, don't they? So that's, that's what you should picture here, only with megaliths. And then it also says the castle looks like it was attacked by a great beast. So this really sounds like a sudden and catastrophic type of event here, right? Some of y'all out there are like, yeah, my, my kid's basically a sudden and catastrophic event. That's about right. But kidding aside... <laughs> Um, it does look like there has been a titanic flood and an earthquake here, does it not? I mean, there's almost none of the curtain wall left. Just a tiny bit of wall clinging to one of the towers. Calling this place a ruined fortress isn't really accurate. It's really just three towers and a bunch of megalithic rubble. It's destroyed. And consider the bit about the children's tower having lost half its crown, meaning it's lost big chunks of stone from its top. That makes more sense as the result of a sudden disaster event where the ground shook than gradual flooding, especially since this tower isn't the leaning one. So it's not even like it leaned and then the weight of the masonry pulled it off. Like, no, it's straight, but it's just missing a big chunk. In other words, what we see here is a pretty good match for the Hammer of the Waters legend, which speaks of giants waking in the earth. That's obviously a good and creative way to describe the ground shaking. And that giant's waking in the earth expression is also used to describe the Horn of Jorman's ability to bring down the wall. So again, this you don't need me, the, the mythical astronomy symbolism guy, to explain this to you. People figured this out long before I hit the forums. Giants waking in the earth, that's obviously an earthquake. And as we look around at Moat Kalen, yeah, it, it looks like it was hammered. Which is to say, it looks like there was an earthquake here as well as a flood. And uh, one additional clue, when Rob's army comes to stay at Moat Kalen... It's uh, the umber sigil that flies atop the children's tower, and the umber sigil is a giant uh, breaking out of chains. So giants waking in the earth, 
were literally planting a flag on it right there on the Children's Tower. And that is to say, there was an earthquake here, and it's the one tied to the Hammer of the Waters. Now, I'm gonna do a separate Castle Pike video, probably two, that, that tale's growing in the telling, I'm working on the script right now. But consider that the Iron Islands also show signs of flooding and earthquakes. There are two different flood accounts in Ironborn legend, one associated with the island-drowning sea dragon, and then one associated with a storm god and the death of the Grey King. Castle Pike, meanwhile, which is so old that no one can say who built it, seems to have had the peninsula it was built upon collapse from underneath of it. Here again, the maesters suggest gradual land erosion in their very scholarly voices, where I say fiddlesticks in my dramatic YouTube voice. This was a disaster. But we'll rip into that one in the Ironborn video. So I just want to point it out now to say that the Iron Islands are on almost an exact parallel latitude to the neck. And so if there was a massive earthquake somewhere in this region that came with tidal wave flooding, it does make sense that it would have affected both the Iron Islands and Moat Kalen. So if all of this stuff is the same disaster, this is a truly epic cataclysm. It's really a compound mega disaster or something like that. But to be honest, the sudden collapse of the Arm of Dorne really is a catastrophe unlike anything in our own recorded history. Essentially the equivalent of several small countries falling into the sea at once. So just by way of example, and please, no one at home, don't try to drop a hammer of the waters on any real countries. Please don't do that. Just imagine, however, the Isthmus of, Pan the Isthmus of Panama. That, that word's never going to get easier to say. Um, it's a strait of land that connects two larger continents, right? Very like the Arm of Dorne used to. So imagine if this pretend hammer of the waters basically sank all the land between Mexico and South America in order to break the land bridge between those two continents. It would be like Guatemala, Costa Rica, Honduras, and El Salvador being reduced to some kind of island chain. And again, please don't try this at home, but that's the scale that we're talking about with the breaking of the Arm of Dorne. So it does seem possible that George Martin is imagining the collapse of the Arm of Dorne land bridge as setting off other fault lines in Westeros, such as the one that may run under the neck and near the Iron Islands. So that's a pretty big disaster. It certainly is. Uh, but I do think there is a coherent trigger mechanism for all of this beyond simply going magic and waving your fingers. That's right. So as I began to lay out in the Hammer of the Waters video, and as I have documented with all of my best evidence in the Nightbringer series, I am very much quite convinced that the trigger mechanism for all this nearly unfathomable destruction was a meteor impact or impacts. In fact, I do definitely think that George Martin was inspired by the dinosaur killer meteor impact that dropped on top of the Yucatan Peninsula, which is of course right next to the Isthmus of Isthmus, oh, it's never gonna happen, Isthmus of Panama, which reminds us of the Arm of Dorne as a continent connecting land bridge. Laugh all you want. That's right, it, it's all kind of right there in the same neighborhood, isn't it? As if George is combining the ideas and thinking about a meteor impact occurring right smack dab in the middle of his own continent connecting land bridge. The land bridge of Panama, that's really what they ought to call it. Gosh, so the meteor impact component of this Westeros mega disaster is mostly off topic for today's discussion. But I did want to mention it briefly now, just because it does provide a mechanism for causing the kind of compound mega disaster that we're picking up the signs of. For this video, we'll just stick with the basic working hypothesis that an earthquake and a flood did happen at Moat Kalen, and that this may well be the same compound disaster that we think of as the hammer of the waters and the breaking of the arm of Dorne. So when the legend says that all of Westeros shook and trembled, that does seem to be the case. All right, so what does all this mean? Well, that Moat Kalen is almost certainly very old. Barring some pretty much totally fantastical explanation, kinda has to have been built before the neck was flooded and transformed into a swamp. And that means it's much older than the Andal invasion, just as it's supposed to be, and that it almost certainly predates the Long Night, just as it's supposed to. In other words, someone was hanging around Westeros in days of yore, building a giant fortress out of black stone megaliths. And friends, let me tell you, it wasn't the damn first men. That's right. Not to go all ancient aliens on you, but the first men didn't build this. Uh, the early first men that we know of 
built ring forts, with the notable exception of a couple of magical or mysterious structures which are associated with Bran the Builder, such as the Wall, Storm's End, and the High Tower, and also Castle Pike on the Iron Islands, which we'll talk about in a different video. So, save for these notable exceptions, which are really more like exceptions that prove the rule, the first men seem to have followed a gradual arc of progress, where their oldest structures were ring forts built atop hills. And then, by the time the Andals invaded, they had seemingly progressed to square castles, such as Raventree Hall, or the older castles on the wall, like the Night Fort. The Andals eventually developed the skill to fashion round towers, so say the Maesters, but this is all long after Moat Kaelin and the flooding of the Neck. And the key thing to remember here is that the Andals are the ones who started writing things down, so everything after the Andal invasion becomes a matter of history, maybe not reliable history, but at least recorded history, as opposed to word of mouth and folkloric history, which can still be reliable, but in, in this case always seems to like sort of have some truth and then, you know, some exaggerations. So Moat Kaelin stands out from these ancient ring forts and castles of the First Men in two ways. One, the blocks used are absolutely huge and therefore would have required far more advanced engineering skill to cut and shape and then to build with than anything else that is demonstrated by the First Men. And two, the style of the fortress doesn't match any other structure anywhere in Westeros. The first point makes itself, uh, so far as we know, the First Men just weren't capable of building Moat Kaelin, simple as that. But the second point, uh, the build style of Moat Kaelin, well, that leads us to a much darker place. A place called Yin in the jungles of Sothorios. Maesters and other scholars alike have puzzled over the greatest of the enigmas of Sothorios, the ancient city of Yin. A ruin older than time, built of oily black stone, in massive blocks so heavy that it would require a dozen elephants to move them. Yin has remained a desolation for many thousands of years, yet the jungle that surrounds it on every side has scarce touched it. A city so evil that even the jungle will not enter, Nymeria is supposed to have said when she laid eyes on it, if the tales are true. Every attempt to rebuild or resettle Yin has ended in horror. Alright, so once again we find a ruined city made of cyclopean blocks of black stone. These would require a dozen elephants to move instead of a hundred men like at Moat Kaelin, so sounds pretty similar. I'm not sure the math works out. About eight or nine people per elephant. I don't know, it seems close. Anyway, the blocks are very big. Once again, we find ourselves in an incredibly hostile swamp. This is more properly a jungle. But it's definitely a swampy jungle, as Yin is on the crocodile-infested, swampy, green river Zamoyos itself. Yin is quite notable for, and this is kind of the main thing, it's built entirely of mysterious and cursed oily black stone. And, as it happens, Moat Kaelin's black basalt might be oily black stone as well. That's right, point of debate. Here we come. This Theon quote from A Dance with Dragons is tantalizing, it's very suggestive, but it's not conclusive, so take a listen. The air was wet and heavy, and shallow pools of water dotted the ground. Reek picked his way between them carefully, following the remnants of the log and plank road that Rob Stark's vanguard had laid down across the soft ground to speed the passage of his host. Last night's rain had left the huge stones wet and glistening, and the morning sunlight made them look as if they were coated in some fine black oil. Now this is definitely a kind of dun 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 moment when you connect it with the oily black stone that we find at Ashai and Yin and the Isle of Toads and on the Iron Islands in the form of the sea stone chair. If we're looking for someone besides the first men who could have built Moat Kaelin, connecting Moat Kaelin to Yin almost raises more questions than it answers, since who built Yin is basically an unanswerable mystery. I'm just kidding, we're gonna answer it today. But let's play along, it's, it's an unanswerable mystery. However, it is helpful to identify the common build technique and similar or possibly even identical building material between Yin and Moat Kaelin, and simply say that these two places may have been built by the same folks, by the same civilization. Because when you have an entirely different technique, style, and level of technology, then we are most likely talking about a different civilization altogether than what we think of as the first men. 
The most coherent possibility for the builders of Yin would seem to be the great empire of the Dawn, whom I believe were the ancient Atlantis-like civilization of dragon lords, who built a shy and were the predecessors of Valyria mentioned by Septon Barth in the world of ice and fire. And if you haven't heard that theory, check out Great Empire of the Dawn, Dragon Lords of Ancient Ashai. Now, Ashai by the Shadow, as many of you will know, is also made entirely of oily black stone, just like Yin. So maybe the people who built Ashai, Great Empire of the Dawn or otherwise, also built Yin. Now, the Great Empire of the Dawn also seems to have come to Westeros based on the fused stone fortress on Battle Isle at Old Town, which we'll talk about in a subsequent video. So it's possible these people also built Moat Caelan if they're in Westeros, right? Now, I'm not sure what the Great Empire of the Dawn would have been doing building Yin in Sothorios. I mean, perhaps they were mining some precious material or capturing freaky animals for the Bloodstone Emperor to do experiments on. But the main ideas here are that the Great Empire of the Dawn seems to have had advanced stoneworking capability, and they seem to have traveled the world. The thing is, the Great Empire of the Dawn is really more well-known for working in fused stone, just based on the idea that they built the Five Forts, which are massive and constructed entirely of fused black dragonstone. And I have an entirely different theory for why the entire peninsula of Ashai is covered in shadow and why the stone is oily there. So I've never really favored the idea that the Great Empire of the Dawn built Yin or Moat Kalin, but like I said, it is a possibility. A related idea would be that the Great Empire of the Dawn taught a few first men some of their advanced building techniques, which were then adapted and used a few times before being lost. And this could even be the truth behind Brandon the Builder, or the legend of Brandon the Builder. Now, the most tantalizing part of this idea that Moat Kalin may have been built by the Great Empire of the Dawn is that it would be then tied to the theory that the walls of Moat Kalin are the walls, plural, uh, from the part of the Night's Watch oath that says... I am the watcher on the walls. That walls, plural, has always been kind of a curiosity since the Night's Watch castles very distinctly don't have walls, plural. And since they very conspicuously walk atop a giant, extremely singular wall. So it really should say, I am the watcher on the wall. That would make more sense. But it says walls, and perhaps this is just a poetic line, but perhaps the original Night's Watch walked different walls, than the giant one made of ice. Some people like the idea that those walls were the walls of the five forts that I just mentioned, if the origins of the watch happened to be in the east along with Azel Rahai and Lightbringer. Or maybe the walls, plural, were the walls of Moat Kalin, because during the long night, it is pretty easy to imagine everything north of the neck being frozen and eventually under the control of the others. So the last hero's journey into the cold, dead lands to find the children and all that may have started at Moat Kalin and then ended in the caves where the Winterfell crypts would later be built, perhaps. I mean, that would make a certain amount of sense, right? The place where Winterfell. This idea may be supported by a rather obscure Old Nan story that Arya recalls in A Clash of Kings. It's only two lines, but it sure sounds like it's talking about the last hero, so check it out. She remembered a story Old Nan had told once about a man imprisoned in a dark castle by evil giants. He was very brave and smart, and he tricked the giants and escaped. But no sooner was he outside the castle than the others took him and drank his hot red blood. So what is this giant's castle outside of which the others were waiting? It must be somewhere in the north, if it's anywhere. So like I said, during the long night, this could have been Moat Kalin, which definitely feels like a giant's castle. With the last hero journeying north from there, the original home of the Night's Watch, and eventually running into the others. I actually do happen to think that the last hero did die at the hands of the others, but was resurrected by the children of the forest. And that would be the missing part in the last hero story, where the uh, the children of the forest helped the last hero. He was, he was alone, his sword broke, surrounded by the others, gets helped by the children, and then he returns at the end of the story, leading the Night's Watch. I think that help was a resurrection, which means the last hero would have been a lot like Cold Hands. Or maybe even Cold Hands is the last hero. The point is, a resurrected Night's Watchman, possibly a resurrected skin changer. Just like Jon Snow is going to be a resurrected skin changer. That's right, this is a whole theory. It's called Green Zombie Theory. And the point of it is that resurrected Night's Watch Rangers, like Cold Hands and like Jon Snow will be, are ideally cut out to face the conditions of the far north. They don't need to eat, don't need to sleep, 
don't need to keep warm, so they're pretty much perfect. And the point of mentioning all that is, again, this, this story about a man in a castle that escapes and is confronted by the others and the others kill him, this could be a match for the last hero story. The other candidate that leaps to mind for this giant's castle outside of which the others were waiting would, of course, be the Night Fort, which is huge and very old and, of course, is strongly associated with the others. So there you go. That's the case for Moat Kalen having been the original walls, plural, walked by the Night's Watch. Obviously, Moat Kalen is nowadays an obstacle for armies marching north, but that's only because the Neck is now a swamp. Perhaps when it was originally built, when all this was solid ground, it would have functioned much differently. And perhaps the other way around, meaning built to keep out enemies from the north. I mean, consider Moat Kalen doesn't really need its walls to guard against southern invaders. It works because it has towers overlooking a causeway in a muddy swamp that you can't cross otherwise. So why build Moat Kalen with 80 foot high megalithic walls? Moat Kalen does seem like a fortress with these walls so high and thick, so yeah, some people do think this was the original fortress of the fighting force that eventually became known as the Night's Watch. Again, I have to mention the Night Fort. I'd actually rank that number one for the original castle of the Watch, but I'd put Moat Kalen second. So there you go. Check out my Secrets of the Night Fort stream for my official theory about the Green Man Watch that I think used to exist at the Night Fort and how they became the Night's Watch. And I'll actually come back to that idea uh, later in this series when we talk about the Pact. So that's the Great Empire of the Dawn possibility, but really, my heart's not in it, guys. I mean, I love the Great Empire of the Dawn. It is my theory, after all, but I just don't think they build Moat Kalen or Yin. I always try to present all the credible possibilities when we take a look at a mystery like this, but let's zero in on the vibe that I think Martin is really trying to lay down with Moat Kalen and Yin as well, which is to say... The Squishers build Moat Kalen and Yin is a strong possibility here. That's right, the Squishers. Merlings, Deep Ones, Selkies, Walrus People. All right, guys, it's, it's, it's actually me. This is just a Squisher head uh, that I skinned off of, a, off of a Merling and tried to steal my baby. You guys better take this seriously or Nimble Dick will come out here quick, fast, and in a hurry and give you a good what for. So let's do take this seriously, folks, because there are, in fact, fish people lurking around the margins of A Song of Ice and Fire. It's true. It's a sign of George's affinity, of course, for certain denizens of H.P. Lovecraft and a few other people's stories. And the fish people in Lovecraft's stories are often associated with strange stone idols and haunted cities. So yeah, Moat Kalen just feels very Lovecraftian, I would say. And specifically, and this comes from my good friend, Grey Waste Tim, Lovecraft expert, check out his channel, The Grey Waste. There are a few different types of beings that we might call fishy humanoids in Lovecraft world, and they all do build cities, sometimes even underwater. So if Moat Kalen and Yin and wherever else has some sort of deep one origin, then George would essentially be leaving like a few signs of some previous cycle of existence from thousands of years further back than the Long Night, or probably even the Great Empire of the Dawn in all likelihood. These types of cities in Lovecraftian stories can be like a million years old or more. So the implication for Yin and Moat Kalen would simply be that they were built by the Squishers a very long time ago, perhaps long before humans ever set foot on Westeros, or perhaps even before humans existed at all. It very well could be that the Northmen at Moat Kalen are basically manning the ruins of an old Squisher palace and enjoying the coincidence that it is now located at one end of a swamp, which acts as a bottleneck for travel between North and South Westeros. No wonder the vibes are off, right? Yeah, so one thing to note, if the Squishers built Moat Kalen, then it actually is possible that the Neck has always been a swamp, even though it does still appear that there was an earthquake here. When I said you can't build a castle in a swamp, I meant people, not Squishers. Squishers are different. And I said you can't. Uh, you're not a Squisher, are you? Again, <laughs> Nimble, Nimble Dick will come out here quick, fast, and in a hurry, so watch out. No, no Squishers allowed. 
it's okay, you can watch if you want to. So l let's go back to the oily black stone itself. And I I'll use my serious voice now. At Yin and Ashai, it does seem to be cursed, right? The jungle seems to be repelled by the stone itself at Yin, and then at Ashai, it seems to be magically toxic. The whole peninsula, only ghost grass grows anywhere near Ashai, and children and animals don't seem to live long there, and so aren't typically found there at all. There could be something similar going on at Moat Kalen as well, but it's just hard to tell because the swamp is so poisonous in its own right. There is lichen and green moss on many of the stones, and one gnarled tree, its limbs festooned with ghost skin. And you can see that here on the art, the tree with the ghost skin, uh, growing between the stones of the gatehouse tower, but that's pretty much it. So it may be that there is something similar going on at Moat Kalen to Nymeria's description of Yin, where the jungle will scarce come near it. Another issue uh, is that the bog devil, I mean the Kronog men, excuse me, uh, shoot all the ironborn full of poison darts when they stay at Moat Kalen. So we can't tell if the ironborn are being sickened by the potentially oily black stone. But I will point out that no one actually lives at Moat Kalen, not, not the Cranog men and not the Northmen, because so far as we know, it's only a fortress which the Northmen will come and man at need. And it's hard not to notice uh, the vibes here, right? I mean, it's kind of similar to Nymeria's description of Yin. When Theon visits Moat Kalen, it's a bunch of sickly, starving ironborn, sort of an abandoned colony, if you will, who are battling flux and disease and rotting of the flesh. It's more or less exactly like the experiences that people have in Sothorios. Thus, I see the common megalithic build style between Yin and Moat Kalen, and this ambiguous quote about Moat Kalen's black stone blocks looking oily, and I tend to think that yes, Moat Kalen is oily black stone, and it was probably built by the same people as Yin, who were probably squishers. In fact, the very idea of a bunch of squids, as the Ironborn are called, of course, sorry for my racial slurs again, uh, the very idea of a bunch of Ironborn squids taking over Moat Kalen might be a sort of poetic clue from the author that it was originally a squisher temple. Consider the particular ironborn who has sort of informally taken charge at Moat Kalen, because his name is Dagon Cod. Is that a threat? One of the Cods pushed to his feet. A big man, but pop-eyed and wide of mouth with dead white flesh. He looked as if his father had sired him on a fish, but he still wore a long sword. Dagon Khan yields to no man. Now, as many of you will know, Dagon is the name of a Mesopotamian rain god who was mistakenly thought to be a fish-headed god, that's actually Oans, for a time between the 19th and 20th century. Although, again, this is a misunderstanding. Oans is the fish-headed god. Dagon is a rain god, not, not a fish man. But H.P. Uh, Lovecraft... He wrote his stories before that mistake was cleared up and actually wrote a story about terrifying squisher people and Blackstone idols called Dagon, which no doubt influenced George R.R. R. Martin. And that's why George is giving us a Dagon cod who looks like a fish-faced squisher half-breed. But he's giving it to us at Moat Kalen, and then he's giving us perhaps the first Squisher blood sacrifice at Moat Kalen in tens of thousands of years. Enough. You think you can frighten Ironborn with words? Be gone. Run back to your master before I open your belly, pull your entrails out, and make you eat them. He might have said more, but suddenly his eyes gaped wide. A throwing axe sprouted from the center of his forehead with a solid thunk. Cod's sword fell from his fingers. He jerked like a fish on a hook then crashed face first onto the table. It was the one-armed man who'd flung the axe. As he rose to his feet, he had another in his hand. Who else wants to die? He asked the other drinkers. Speak up, I'll see you do. Thin red streams were spreading out across the stone from the pool of blood where Dagon Cod's head had come to rest. Me, I mean to live, and I don't mean staying here to rot. All right, so Dagon's squisher blood is streaming across the possibly oily black stone table after jerking like a fish on a hook. So you see what's happening here, right? This is an unholy squisher blood sacrifice abomination with the sacrificed Dagon fish face sprawled out on the feast table for everyone to eat. Nom, 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 that's right. 
And such unholy blood sacrifice could even be what creates the magical oily black stone for all we know. So perhaps George is even showing us how this stuff is made with squisher blood sacrifice. No wonder it's oily. I mean, have you ever tasted squisher? Ugh. There's also some very nice symbolic wordplay here, just to hammer the point home. Dagon's head is chopped by a one-armed man. Now, George does love people with chopped off bits, that's very true, but this may be a line intended to get the reader to think about the arm of Dorne and the hammer of the waters. And I'd say this knowing full well that there is actually a long list of fight scenes with people taking arm wounds, often coupled with neck wounds, that do seem to symbolize the breaking of the arm of Dorne and the drowning of the neck. We mythheads have actually been calling these the hammer of the waters injuries for several years now. And one of the most famous examples is the fight scene between Oberyn Martell and Gregor the Mountain Clegane. And you can find that broken down in detail, in lots of detail, in one of my very oldest videos. I think it's my fourth ever. The Mountain versus the Viper and the Hammer of the Waters. The Mountain gives the Hammer of the Waters injuries to a stable boy in that fight where he chops off his arm and then his neck or like half his head. And then Oberyn Martell with his sun spear, which has an oily black steel tip, hits the first major wound of the fight on Gregor's arm. There's a bunch of symbolism happening. It's very cool. Check it out. And another great example is Ario Hota's rapid dismembering of Sir Ari's Oakheart, where Ario slices him at the arm, chops his arm off, and then chops his head off. So arm and neck wound in rapid succession. And it's of course, done with that wicked giant axe that Arya Hota has, like eight feet long. Yikes. So a man named Oakheart obviously makes a good symbol of Westeros as a land, Oakheart. And so does a man named the Mountain. Because again, he sounds like topography. And then he takes the, uh, the Arm of Dorm wound from the Sun Spear. So setting aside the one arm thing and the symbolism, perhaps you're skeptical of such wordplay clues. No worries, no worries. This Dagon Cod Ad Mode Kalen scene is nevertheless much cooler when you identify the Lovecraftian squisher lore that's sort of layered all over it, right? So the question we're asking is could this be a clue about squishers having built Moat Kalen and therefore potentially Yeen as well? Let's head back towards Yeen actually and visit the nearby Isle of Toads on the way, where we find fish people and oily black stone together. So happy together. So happy together. That's right, uh, the maesters, writing in the world of ice and fire, tell us that... Ruins found upon the Isle of Tears, the Isle of Toads, and Axe Island hint at some ancient civilization, but little is now known of these vanished men of the Dawn Age. If any still survived when the first Corsairs settled on the islands, they were soon put to the sword so no trace of them now remains, save perhaps upon the Isle of Toads, as we shall discuss shortly. Hmm, okay, a lost civilization of the Dawn Age, that's cool. I wonder what sort of... On the Isle of Toads can be found an ancient idol, a greasy black stone crudely carved into the semblance of a gigantic toad of malignant aspect, some 40 feet high. The people of this isle are believed by some to be descended from those who carved the toad stone, for there is an unpleasant fish-like aspect to their faces, and many have webbed hands and feet. If so, they are the sole surviving remnant of this forgotten race. Sole surviving remnant? <laughs> what ignorance! As anyone who's ever watched Nimble Dick Squisher Hunt knows, there are also fishy-looking people living upon the Thousand Islands in far northern Essos. Plus there's that Dagon Cod fellow we just met and his family. And then we have those Borels with their occasionally webbed hands and feet on the Three Sisters Islands. The Borels say that ones born such have the mark and consider it a kind of honor. And like the Iron Islands, the Three Sisters Islands are just offshore of the neck at a basically parallel latitude. And just north of these waters is White Harbor, where we find both fishy folklore and fishy-looking Manderleys, who, like the Borels, seem to have the Innsmouth look that Lovecraft describes his squisher hybrid humans as having. And basically, the description of Dagon Cod's pop-eyed, dead-looking, that's exactly the Innsmouth look. So go back and check out the Manderleys and the Borels, and they've all got it. 
Then there are those diminutive Cranog men who actually live in the swamps of the Neck, all around Moat Kalen. The Cranog men supposedly bred with the children of the forest, perhaps more so than the other first men did, and that's why they're short. Uh, but some of the descriptions of them, exaggerated and even false as they may be, actually match Nimble Dick's description of the Squishers. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Nimble Dick says that the Squishers are damp and fishy smelling, but behind these blubbery lips, they got rows of green teeth, sharp as needles. Meanwhile, little Walter Frey says that the Cranog men, whom he calls frog eaters, like, sorry, again, all the racial slurs on this uh, video, that the Cranog men have green teeth for eating frogs, just as the Squishers are said to have green teeth. Little Walter further says that frog eaters don't smell like men and that they have a boggy stink like frogs and trees and scummy water. Moss grows under their arms in place of hair and they can live with nothing to eat but mud and breathe swamp water. Now, here's the thing. Even Jojen says that Mira can breathe mud, which is swamp water, and who knows what he means by that, but this isn't really children of the forest stuff is the point. Even worse, I mentioned the different types of aquatic humanoids in Lovecraft's taxonomy, right? Well, there are three. The deep ones, who live underwater and are the most fish-like. The lizard men, whom we don't really need to discuss here, but may be an influence on the lizard men that we find, the shrikes and things like that. And then there are the men from Ib, who are the frog people. The froggy men from Ib live in the gray stone city of Ib, which is by the shore of this huge lake, and sharing some physical characteristics of the Deep Ones, they live half their lives on land and half in the water, like frogs. The froggy men from Ib are wiped out by the haughty humans from Sarnath, which then leads to the doom that came to Sarnath, which is actually the title of the book that contains the story of these events. Also worth noting, uh, said doom came to Sarnath through means of a creepy stone idol of the god of the frog people, which may have been a frog toad statue. You see where this is going, oily blackstone toad idol, right? In other words, the idea of frog people who live in a swamp by a dark stone fortress that might be oily blackstone is absolutely 100% inspired by H.P. Lovecraft's Froggy Men from Ib. And you'll notice that Martin sort of recycles the name Ib for his hairy men of Ib, as well as using the name Sarnath for the name of a Sarnori city. So he's changed the specific associations of those names, but he's using those concepts elsewhere. So there is a high likelihood that the Cranog men themselves, therefore, not only have child of the forest blood, but also some kind of squisher blood. And that is why some of the wilder folklore about them seems to overlap with the much more reliable Squisher folklore. It's very solid, very solid. All the sources check out. In other words, we know that fish people do exist, and more importantly, they seem to have bred quite extensively with humans in ancient Westeros. And they seem to have left their genetic imprint specifically in the general region of Moat Kalen and the Neck, and that sort of midsection of Westeros, from the Iron Islands all the way over to Cracklaw Point, where, of course, <laughs> Nimble Dick lives and there are legends of squishers aplenty, as well as a witch named Ursula Upcliff. I don't know if Ursula the witch has anything to do with squisher stuff, maybe. So if the Deep Ones, Merlings, Selkies, Walrus Men, etc., left their genes and cultural imprint all across the midsection of Westeros like that, did they leave one of their castles as well in the form of Moat Kalen? That is the question. And by the way, I, I know that the idea of squishers is fun. We all laugh about it and it seems weird, but it's really no weirder than the idea that humans can breed with the children of the forest, who are definitely animal-like. I used the word therianthropic in the last video. That just means animal-like, humanoid, essentially. The children have four-fingered, black-clawed hands. They have skin that is dappled like a doe. They have golden slitted eyes like that of a cat or a snake. And who'd really be surprised if they turned out to have little tails at the back there? Not that Brand needs to go looking. Sorry, that was awkward. Um, the Targaryens, of course, are also lizard people. And then there's every kind of monster on Sothorios and in the Great Waste. 
Some of those seem to be human-animal hybrids. There's shrikes and lizard men and all kinds of stuff. That's just how evolution and biology works in A Song of Ice and Fire. Shit gets weird late at night in the deep woods or out on the shoreline. Gosh, those mermaids are pretty. Oh uh, yeah, anyway. So as for the Isle of Toads, the thing to note here is that there is a concentration of especially fish-like people, and there's also a 40-foot high toad idol carved from an oily black stone. All of this is straight out of Lovecraft, like I said, and all of this reminds us of the Ironborn, equally straight out of Lovecraft, and their sea stone chair, which is a large throne-like hunk of oily black stone carved into the shape of a majestic kraken. That's right. Oh, it's, it's a thing of beauty. You can't find that on Etsy, but uh, somewhere in a shy, maybe there's a very weird furniture store where you can buy a sea stone chair and a, and a toad idol. I kid, of course, but the sea stone chair, which we're going to talk a lot more about in the Ironborn video, and the toad idol are both carved from hunks of oily black stone, as opposed to being carved in place from the local bedrock. And so we can assume that the toad idol and the oily black stone kraken throne came from somewhere else. Even a 40 foot high stone idol can be transported by flotation. Uh, the Egyptians did that with their obelisks. So did these idols come from a shy? They might have, or they may have come from Yin, and I'm not sure which is worse, frankly. Not something I'd keep in my castle, but I guess that's just how the Greyjoys roll. So the thing we're looking for that we found on the Isle of Toads is obviously the conjunction of fish people and oily black stone. The Ironborn have legends that say they themselves, of course, are fish people descended from the Deep Ones, and of course, they have a black oily stone idol. And really, I mean, if, if someone saw an island of people that all looked like Dagon Cod, how different would that be than what we hear about the people on the Isle of Toads? Maybe not much. And whether the Ironborn have Deep Ones blood or not, they, they definitely do, there is ample evidence to suggest that they are not first men and came to Westeros by sea from somewhere else. So getting back to Moat Kaelin, where we have potentially Squisher-like Cranog men, although I don't really think they built Moat Kaelin. It's just a sign of Squisher activity in the area. A lot of the question of who did build Moat Kaelin kind of hinges on whether or not this is oily black stone or just black basalt that looks oily when wet. Although I don't really know why George would describe it as looking like it was coated in a fine black oil and tease us like that when he's working the oily black stone thing. So I'm like 75% that it is. Maybe even 80%. And if it is oily black stone, then the fact that its construction style seems to resemble yin so closely becomes very compelling, even overwhelming. And I'd have to lean towards those two places having a shared origin, which is likely a squisher origin. And even if the stone is slightly different in the two locations, and Moat Kalen's black basalt isn't oily black stone per se, it could just be that the squisher builders of yin used the local type of black stone when they came to build Mount Kalen, which was this black basalt, and then just used the same building style that they had used to build Yin. These two constructions could even be thousands of years apart in Squisher history, because that goes pretty far back, as I understand. Now let's talk basalt for a second, because there's some pretty interesting stuff that I found. So black basalt is a volcanic silicate rock, which either comes to the surface via volcanic activity or by the churning up of magma at a fault line. Now, there are hot springs at Winterfell, which is kind of close, but there's obviously no volcano here at the neck. Uh, but there definitely could be a fault line, like we mentioned earlier. Perhaps the Arm of Dorne earthquake triggered this potential fault line, and that's why we see this earthquake-like activity at the neck and potentially at the Iron Islands. And just to be clear, we don't know what kind of rock oily black stone is. I mean, it could all be basalt, perhaps magically enchanted or watered with blood sacrifice basalt. The Egyptians, whom I just mentioned, built many of their statues out of black basalt. So it kind of makes sense to imagine oily black stone idols being magically cursed basalt. Now, I couldn't find whether or not Lovecraft actually names the type of stone uh, for any of his idols, but he did borrow Egyptian iconography, names, and concepts pretty heavily in his stories. So black basalt Egyptian statues certainly could be a part of George's inspiration here by way of Lovecraft. All right, now I'm very excited to show you guys 
a find that I made while writing the script, which is definitely, definitely a major inspiration for what George has done here with Moat Kalin, the neck, and the breaking of the arm of Dorne. And black basalt, oh yes. It's called the Giant's Causeway, and it's found in northern North Ireland. The Giant's Causeway, as you can see here, is an area of about 40,000 interlocking black basalt columns. They're dark gray, but close enough, just like Valerian steel, dark gray, black, same thing. And these, are, uh, these columns are the result of an ancient volcanic fissure eruption. So as you can see, it does look like a weird kind of stone bridge that disappears into the sea or emerges from the sea. Even cooler, across the water on the English side, the same ancient lava flow left the same type of fractured basalt columns at a rather famous place called Fingal's Cave on an uninhabited island in the Hebrides. This gave rise to a myth about a pair of opposing giants building the causeway from either side so that it could have a fight in the middle. In one version, the Irish giant, Finn McCool, and he's not always a giant, he's a folk hero, but in this one he's a giant, he defeats the Scottish giant Bendendonner. Nice and clean, but another version includes more detail. And in that version, it has Bendendonner coming over to the Irish side. And instead of finding his opponent, he finds a baby giant, a huge baby giant. Now, thinking that if the baby giants over on this side were so large, the adults, well, they must be truly massive and terrifying. So Bendendonner flees back to Scotland ripping up the causeway as he goes. Thing is, that was, that was no baby. It was simply the giant Finn McCool disguised as a baby to trick Bend and Donner. Very clever, and it worked. So here then is where George got a major part of his notion for an isthmus of land that connects two larger bodies being destroyed in order to separate, you know, people that want to fight. And more specifically, where he got the idea to leave a giant's castle made of black basalt at one end of it. The neck, of course, isn't a causeway, it's, it's an isthmus of land, but it did have a wooden causeway built for Rob's army to cross it, one that started at Moat Kalin. And Moat Kalin certainly does look like a giant's castle, as we mentioned earlier, with its austere, megalithic construction style. And now that we've uncovered this inspiration from Moat Kalin, it seems even more like it's supposed to be a giant's castle, right? And that, in turn, means that old Nan's Weird little story about that guy trapped in the giant's castle who got, you know, chased by the others. It may be, it's, it's one more point in favor of it being Moat Kalen, let's say that. So I want to point out here that it's not just the Neck and Moat Kalen that seem inspired by this legend of the giant's causeway, but also the breaking of the arm of Dorne. It's the same setup with the Hammer of the Waters legend and this Bend and Donner Finn McCool legend. We're breaking a land connector in order to separate two people who are at war. And you'll notice that the basalt columns of the Giant's Causeway and Fingal's Cave look and function as stepping stones. That's right, uh, look at all the happy tourists stepping on the step stones of the sunken causeway. The step stones of the sunken... Yeah, that's right. Uh, the Stepstones, a.k.a. the name of the islands, which are all that is left of the broken arm of Dorne. The thing I want to stress here is that George is drawing inspiration from the same thing for both the Hammer of the Waters disaster and the disaster at the Neck and Moat Kalen. And that seems like an indication that George did in fact conceive of the Hammer of the Waters as one big interconnected disaster that involved the breaking of the arm of Dorne as well as the flooding of the Neck and the Durin God's Grief flooding. Because um, George is, you know, he's drawing inspiration from the same thing to create his legends of all of those, you know, all of those things, which is obviously Monty Python, as we discussed. That burned down, fell over, then sank into the damn swamp. Oh, oh and, this, and this one with Ben and Donner and Finn McCool. And yeah, some of you may have noticed that that bit about the giant Finn McCool disguising himself as a baby kind of reminds us of the children of the forest and how they're actually not children at all, but in fact super duper old, and call themselves cousins of the giants. But, of course, there's a lot of Irish folklore behind the children of the forest, the giants, and the others especially. And finally, it's time for fun with maps. As some of you know, the map of Westeros is actually fashioned from some cut-and-paste cartography of Ireland and the United Kingdom. Southern Westeros is pretty much exactly upside-down Ireland, with Dorne tacked on, and northern Westeros above the neck 
is really just the southern half of the UK that's been mangled and reshaped a bit. It's pretty obvious once you see the picture of it here, and that means that the Giant's Causeway's real-world location is actually very close to where the Neck and Mokalen would be. At least if you rotate Ireland 180 degrees, but leave the Giant's Causeway in the north. So the Neck and Moat Caelan, which function like the broken Giant's Causeway, are also in the same spot. So yes, definitely an inspiration. Sticking with the upside down map, you may be interested to note that Derry became Starfall and Belfast became Old Town. The Giant's Causeway in real Ireland is located between Derry and Belfast, meaning between Starfall and Old Town, and it's interesting to note that George put some more black stone at Old Town in the form of the fused stone fortress that is the base of the high tower. We'll rip into Old Town and that fortress in a later video in this series, so put a pin in that. And also, shout out to Dublin slash Casterly Rock. And finally, just for giggles, I'll point out that George likes to speak of Moat Caelan as the cork that bottles up the armies coming up from the south of the Neck. I guess he didn't like the barn doors, horses expression, uh, and the Irish city of Cork is located where the neck would connect to upside down Ireland. So it's the Cork that bottles up the, yeah, it's, it's probably a map joke from George and I wanted to share it with you. So guys, thanks for watching these longer videos. I uh, hope you're enjoying the Disaster Hunters of Westeros series. And I'll be back with the Ironborn video next. It'll probably be Ironborn part one. And it's, I'm really looking forward to it. We're gonna get to an actual real theory about what's going on with the Squishers, and the Oily Blackstone and all that. So watch out for that. Make sure you subscribe, like I said, and I will see you next time. Also, thank you very much to my patrons, Patreon patrons, and my YouTube channel member Squishers. You guys keep the lights on that's why i can do what i do and i love doing what i do so thank you very much peace and out and though there are a few different types of beings that we might call fishy humanoids they all do build cities sometimes even underwater